Hello, everyone, and welcome to Build It Yourself. My name is Andrew Scriver. I am one of the co-curators of the Level Up Symposium, and uh, I use he, him pronouns. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this event, uh, which is being presented by the Associated Designers of Canada with support from Toaster Lab's Mixed Reality Performance Atelier. And I am a member of the ADC. I'm really excited to be your host for this event. Uh, I'd like to first mention that I'm coming to you from Montreal, which has been a point of conflict, conference, creativity, and exchange since time immemorial for many Indigenous peoples, including the Anishinaabe, Huron-Wendat, and Abenaki nations. The people of the Kenyan Kahaka nation, known in English as the Mohawk, are now considered the caretakers of this land and the water around Montreal. So in their language, this island bears the name of Chachage, which means broken in two because of the way that the water bends around it. So the river has made uh, contemporary Montreal into a vibrantly diverse city. That diversity is inspiring because it is telling each other our stories that we build bridges between our different cultures and languages. And so with that, we offer you this presentation as part of the Level Up Symposium in our way of our sharing our stories and uh, we hope that this will hopefully open your minds to affirm our collective humanity. Uh, so I want to first quickly thank all of our sponsors and funders. Uh, so the Canada Council for the Arts, which is the primary funder of our symposium as a whole, as well as our additional funders, the IATSE, uh, University of British Columbia, Theatre Alberta, uh, Sorry, Theatre Alberta, CITT Alberta Chapter, Ryerson University, Con uh, Concordia University, York University, as well as all of our other individual donors and supporters. So I want to let you know that for your information, all of our symposium events are being recorded and will be presented freely upon the completion of the events here. Uh, So uh, thank you for joining us today. If you're watching up this live stream, either on the Level Up website, uh, levelup.designers.ca, on HowlRound at HowlRound.com, or through our partners with Toaster Lab or on the respective Facebook pages for the ADC or Toaster Lab. Regardless of your viewing platform, and that it on the same page as a video is the chat function, uh, where you can ask questions at any time, and those will be seen Actually, we're going to be, as part of this event, we're going to be sending out those questions as they come up to the uh, to our presenters. So please feel free to ask those questions at any time, and we will be happy to uh, answer them as quickly as we can. Um, so uh, I'm going to now just quickly introduce you to our presenter today, Matthew Waddell, uh, who's a longtime friend and mentor of mine. Uh, and uh, Matt is, pardon me, I'm just trying to find my notes. So uh, Matthew is a Calgary-based artist and educator. Uh, he's spent the last 15 years exploring relationships between humans and technology. His work spans 3D animation, projection mapping, interactive installation, and audio-visual design for live performance. So driven by a desire to better understand the inner workings of the machine, Matt builds custom software solutions that facilitate provocative, inspiring, and entertaining art experiences that reflect the dichotomy of attraction and repulsion he feels each time he engages with his computer. So, uh, so uh, with all of that, I'm going to pass it off to Matt to be our first presenter for the symposium. We're very happy to have you here and very excited for everything that you're going to be presenting. Thanks so much, Andrew. I'm super happy to be here too and so glad that the symposium's opening today. Uh, I think this is a really great opportunity that you're putting on and everyone that's been working on uh, the Level Up Symposium. Thank you so much. This is a great thing to be doing right now in Canada. Um, I just want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Calgary, which is in Tree 7 territory, and that's home to the Blackfoot, 
the Sitsina and the Akainai Lakota First Nations, uh, as well as uh, Metis Nation Three, Region Three. Um, I think as creators, it's good to acknowledge that we are in a long line of creators and to remember that people have been here for a long time uh, working and being creative and imagining things. So we're all part of that. Uh, I'm so happy that you're joining me here today. Uh, I'm going to say right off the bat that uh, this talk isn't going to be just about how to make things with computers, uh, although I'm going to get into that because I really like making things with computers. Um, but what this is about is reimagining the way that we engage with technology and the tools that are currently available to us. Uh, how can we use the vast amount of technology that we have at our fingertips to serve our needs? as artists, as designers, and most importantly, as human beings. How do we engage with technology? Is it really working for us? Is it influencing us? Or maybe is it controlling us? These are things that I'm thinking about all the time and uh, I don't have an answer to, but hopefully we can explore a bit of that today. Because let's face it, Technology is here, and it's here to stay. Not only that, but it's advancing at a speed that we have never thought possible. Just as an example, how many of us can remember way back so long ago before the smartphone? It seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? Uh, and maybe for some people watching, it was a lifetime. Um, but just think about all the ways that this technology has shaped our lives. Now consider this, the smartphone is only 13 years old. The first iPhone was released in 2007, which when you think about it is just mind boggling. Think of how huge of an impact that technology has had on the world, has had on the way we communicate with each other, the way we get information, the way we, the way we share our stories. It's really unfathomable. And this is just one example. There are countless other technologies that have had a huge impact in our lives in the last years. The internet, social media, video conferencing, here we are, hello, drones, automatic cars, I mean, the list can go on and on. So my challenge for you over the next 90 minutes, perhaps, is to ask yourself, who's in control of the technology that we use? Are we in control or is it controlling us? And it's my hope that during this time, we will learn how to gain some of that control back. In this lecture, we're going to get an introduction into the world of custom-made performance tools. I'm going to talk about what they are, when you should use them, why I've been chosen to invest so much of my practice and time and mental capacity into this field. Uh, I'm going to talk about the challenges, the obstacles you may face when you decide to go down this path. Um, I'm going to look at some of the cost benefits of working with custom tools. Uh, and I'm going to dissect two of probably my most technically ambitious projects that I've worked on in the last few years. Um, the Last Voyage of Donald Crowhurst and Deep Website. Also, I'm going to be answering your questions as you have them. Uh, and Emily, who's behind the scenes, hi Emily, thank you so much, will be popping them up on the screen here. And uh, hopefully I see them and am able to ask them. So I'd love to hear your questions. I'm also going to take some time at the end of the talk. Uh, if there's anyone that has questions, I would love to hear them. So let's, let's start a conversation. Um, I'm going to say this isn't going to be tuper, <laughs> tuper, super technical, uh, so don't worry if you're new to these sort of things. Um, what is important is that you understand the concepts and the methodologies behind custom tool creation. 
so that you have a better understanding of how it can benefit you as an artist, as a designer, or maybe as a theater company or a production house or whatever it is. Um, if you're interested in learning more of the nuts and bolts and the technical know-how of how things like projection mapping, um, working with a computer as an artist, using readily available tools like QLab or Touch Designer. Um, if you're interested in the more details of this, um, stick around to the end and I'll talk about a, a cool project that we're working on that you might be interested in. Uh, I'm going to cover a lot of things, so I hope you're ready to go on a bit of a ride here. And first, I'd like to show a reel that we have. So, Emily, if we could play that right now. Thanks. Um, that was just a reel of some of the things I've been up to in the last few years. Uh, this is work that I've done with uh, a bunch of people, uh, and uh, it's part of our uh, studio, Access and Media Arts. So I'm going to talk about that later, um, and we can get into some of that if there's more time. But uh, I just thought I would start just by briefly talking about um, a bit of my personal story and how I've got to where I am now. Uh, I've always been interested in technology. I grew up with computers around the house and early access to the internet. I was browsing the internet at seven years old in 1991 um, when it first kind of came out. Uh, in fact, I actually have here one of my first computers. I was not browsing the internet on this, but this is one of my first computers that I have that I've kept. It's an old Mac classic. I just wanted to show you that because I think it's neat. I also want to show you this mouse because look at this thing. This thing is so satisfying. I wish I could find a way to plug that in. Does anybody know how to convert this into USB? <laughs> um, oh, and also, by the way, this is now, uh, this is a computer which is one hundredth of the size and probably 100,000 times more powerful. This is a Raspberry Pi. So it's amazing how, how fast things have changed. Um, I went to computer camp when I was young. I, I remember learning how to do early programming using this program, uh, Turtle Draw, uh, made by Logo Company. You would type in commands and you would program this little turtle uh, character to like draw a house or draw a triangle. Um, that was my first kind of exposure to, to computer art. Uh, I made some websites when I was growing up. Uh, I really liked Dolphins and the band Everclear, so I made a Dolphin Everclear website uh, that I hosted for a while. <laughs> Embarrassing fact. I, I wonder if anybody can find that. Um, I also made, I think, what I consider my first piece of proud digital art when I was 16. And that was a Photoshop version of my uh, driver's license that allowed me to go see uh, No Means No at the Night Gallery Bar, uh, which was 18. I don't recommend anybody does that. I'm not uh, 
encouraging any such activity, but that was my first realization of the power of uh, computers and technology and how I could warp reality with them. Uh, after high school, I moved to Montreal and I went to Concordia University there where I studied electroacoustic composition and sound technology. And uh, it was there that I met some great friends and collaborators, uh, my friend Phil, who I'm always grateful for. Um, we started uh, a band and I, uh, I started performing using a laptop. This was in 2006 and it was before um, laptops were really that common on stage. And uh, I was playing actually in an experimental jazz group. Um, and so uh, I was one of the few people you playing a laptop, calling myself a musician uh, uh, at the time. Um, and I got teased for it all the time. It was kind of funny looking back on that. But um, I started using custom software, well, software that allowed me to create custom tools I uh, called Max MSP. And this allowed me to build my own audio software. And so I, um, I created a instrument that I could control using a controller with knobs and dials. And it allowed me to record sounds uh, either on the spot or take sounds that I'd recorded previously and manipulate them in real time. So I could perform by playing these kind of sound effects like the sound of a river or uh, biting into an apple and I could slow these down. I could add uh, reverb or EQs or delays in real time. And I could, I kind of became part of the percussive section of the band. Um, uh, and so this experience was really great because it showed me the power of custom tools. At the time, this was kind of before Ableton or any other sort of live performance software was really popular. Um, there was kind of like DJ, like beat software, Reactor and um, Resl or I forget the other name, that other popular one, but it was all kind of in the like quantized beat making realm. Uh, I wanted to create my own tool. I wanted something that allowed me to just manipulate things, layer sounds, you know, if I turned a knob, if I turn it halfway, EQ the sound. And then if I kept turning it, add delay to it. And then if I turned it all the way, add reverb onto all that. Like I wanted to have these custom control and there was nothing available commercially or pre-made that allowed me to do that. So I realized I had to do it myself. Um, and it was really rewarding. It was very challenging because I had to learn essentially a new language, which the language of Max MSP. Uh, I'll get into some specifics of that software and other software later, but it's a, there's a bit of a learning curve. Um, but I loved it. Um, if you can't tell already, I'm a bit of a geek. I like computer things. Uh, it certainly has helped. Um, I, my first uh, experience with theater was on a summer break in 2007, and a, a friend that I was working with back in Calgary he uh, he was a theater creator, Jason Carnu, and he asked me if I wanted to do sound design for this piece, this theater play that he had written. And I had no idea what sound design was. Um, he just knew that I liked music and I had a big collection of music and sound effects and that I was composing things. And so he asked me, hey, do you want to do sound design? And I said, sure. And um, we did our performance at Mutton Busting Festival at the High Performance Rodeo, and it went pretty well. Um, I made some sounds. I like found some other sounds, and I just kind of gave it to them, and they kind of arranged it. It was kind of like a half sound designer, I guess. But then um, this piece kind of took off, and it, we started working with uh, Eric Rose at Ghost River Theater in Calgary. And uh, we... Uh, worked on the play and we got it to into a festival in Edmonton. And I realized as we were there rehearsing, I have no idea how to like program this show. And I, I have all these sounds and they're all on my computer and they're audio files, but I have no idea how to like actually make this thing work. Um, and so when I went researching, I discovered that the way you do that is you burn CDs and you put one sound here and you put one sound here and then you kind of like crossfade one out and, and the other one in. And I was just like baffled that this is how you do this. It just, 
I know I understand it's a step up from reel to reel, uh, you know, tape uh, playback and doing it that way. But just this idea of having to commit to like burning my audio onto a CD and then like if I wanted to add a thing like that would mess up the order. It was just I couldn't do it. And so I went searching for another tool. And first I thought, hey, I'll just make a playback system in Max MSP. But then I discovered that um, uh, there was a piece of software that had just been released in the summer of 2007, which was called QLab. And I found it on some post and downloaded it. And it was you know, a free download. And it works so well. I was able to load all my sounds in. I was able to create these kind of automatic sequences that would play a sound. And then when I trigger the next cue, it would fade out this sound and fade this one in and then start another sound under here and then fade it away. And I was able to create this complex layering of sounds and uh, sequences that I was really happy with. And um, you know, I consider that in a way kind of custom programming, you know, you're able to create this show by using QLab commands, right? Which is a form of programming. Um, and uh, I realized that this, what I was able to do with QLab wasn't possible previously. You know, if I were to ask a sound operator, okay, I need you to fade this cue out like exactly 10 seconds and then fade this other one in, but then wait two seconds and then fade a third sound in at like a slightly lower level that's like low enough for the actors that we can still hear their voice and then fade it out after five seconds and then fade out this one. Like it would be almost impossible. And for certain things I was doing, absolutely impossible. Like layering sounds, it would just be too much to ask. So computer was really the answer here. And um, I have to say, though, at the time, convincing people to adopt a computer as a playback device for the theater, uh, it wasn't easy. There was a lot of resistance because people had this idea that computers were these crappy things that crashed all the time and that were unreliable and that nobody would ever use a computer to make live art. Um, and so I met a lot of resistance. And resistance has kind of been a theme that I've faced throughout my um, throughout my career, I'd say, uh, you know, encouraging people to to kind of buy into technology, especially in the theater. It's hard sometimes and it's still hard. Um, but I like stuck with it and I was like, no, this is the answer. Like this thing works. And most importantly is I tested it to make sure it worked. I started programming the show when we were in rehearsal and I was running the whole show. I had the whole show program before we even got into the theater. What that did also was I think quite a game changing thing was it allowed me to use the time that normally would be spent, you know, sitting uh, either in the booth or in the audience and giving commands to an operator on how to program my show and say, no, uh, fade time, three seconds, like volume up, two dBs, whatever it was. Um, it I allowed me to take that time and to kind of front load it and to do it beforehand so that when we got into the theater, I was able to just set one relative level. And then I could go in and start actually making this show sound the best that it possibly could. Right, I was able to sit in the audience. I could make EQ changes on the fly. I could like completely reprogram sounds. You know, I was using Logic, so I could change sound sequences and export them, and then send them to the booth, and they would instantly be updated. Um, it was just like it felt. I mean, it was my first experience, so I didn't know what anything else was like, but it just felt right to me. Um, and now, think about like. QLab, of course, everybody's using QLab, and of course that makes sense. But it wasn't that long ago that that we were still, you know, playing our sounds off of CDs, and I really don't, I don't feel too uh, envious of those people that had to do that because that sounds like it would really impact the art. For me, using technology in live performance isn't about just, oh, I can use a computer because it's fun and I like computers. It's really about making better art. Isn't that what we want to do? Like, isn't that the reason that we're in this is to make good art? 
it's not to, I mean, sure, it's fun to be able to like play with these new toys and like do these fancy things. But really what I've tried to do all along and I hope what everybody is trying to do is make better art, use the tools that are available to us to ramp up, to level up our practice. Isn't that what this is all about, damn it? Um, so, uh, Oh, just to say that production, which was the first sound design I ever did, it actually won a sound design award, a Betty Mitchell award. Um, and I say that not to kind of toot my own horn, but because I really believe that that production, part of the success of that, and probably a large part of that was my methodology and was the technology that I used to create that show. And I was able to create something that was unique and different because of the tools that I had at my disposal. And at the time, the tools that I had at my disposal were a Mac laptop, Logic software, a sound card, a crappy Motu, not even a, <clears throat> what was that? I forget, an old sound card that I had and a crappy microphone. That was it. And QLab. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, I've since learned that computers and theater are, should be friends. Computers and live performance should be friends. Computers and the arts should be friends because there's so much. We have like every year, there's just so much more opportunity to do cool, neat things with computers and to make our lives easier. Why not use these things? Um, I know the idea of technology isn't new in theater, but it's like, I have to say theater sometimes needs a bit of a boot in the behind to like get on board. <laughs> I'm sorry. We could talk about that later. Um, as I was developing uh, my theater practice, I was still finishing school, but I was also, I was also started to work on my own new media arts practice. Um, so I was working on interactive installations, sound, uh, sound installations, like multi-channel work. Oh, that's another thing I should mention. The sound design that I did, that's another thing that QLab allowed me to do that I don't think you could do, it would be impossible without it, is multi-channel audio. So I used four speakers to make a surround sound environment. That's like another huge game changer um, and something that I really encourage everyone that's doing sound design to invest in because it's not that hard and it can really make your sound design leveled up. Um, so I, I worked on, for example, I worked on a dance piece where we had a live camera and it was recording um, some of the movements of the performers on stage and it was translating that into a real time uh, audio synthesis device so that people could like move, they would dance and it would create like a musical composition based on their movement. Um, I also started integrating video projection into my work at this time. Um, and that's kind of what led me to where I am now. I've, I've done a lot of different things and I've kind of switched directions a lot of times. And, but one thing that's remained common the whole time is my belief that technology is a good thing for the arts and that although, well, it's a good thing, but for the arts, but it's also a scary thing for society and you know, I, as much as I promote technology as a tool, I am very trepidatious of it. And I know its effects, especially when we talk about surveillance, social media, um, and a project that I'll talk about later, Deep Website, talks about some of that. But it's kind of a double-edged sword. But right now, I'm just going to talk about the good things. So enough about me. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, what I'd like to talk about now is an intro to custom tools for live performance. So what am I talking about here? When I say custom tools, I mean software or hardware that you've developed that does something unique that another piece of software can't do, or software or hardware that requires you to program something in order for it to work or software that allows you to make your own software. Um, and if we use QLab as an example, I think Q 
QLab kind of is software that allows you to make your own software in a way. I mean, it's not as technical as other programming languages, but really it allows you to do some pretty customized things. And these, the idea of custom tools, they can be very simple or they can be very complicated and there's no right or wrong answer. And I think uh, what's important to remember, especially if you're starting off, is that you don't have to build the most crazy complex tool in order to do something cool, right? You could make a simple modification to something or you could create a simple custom tool that just makes your life easier or just allows you to do something that couldn't quite be done otherwise. So it's about extending the possibilities of what's possible, I guess. Um, I've chosen this path because most of the time I couldn't find another solution to do what I wanted to do. And I'm going to give a very concrete example of this when I talk about the last voyage of Donald Crowhurst. Um, sometimes software doesn't exist that does the exact thing that you want it to do. Um, also, there might be software that does that, but it might be really expensive. So um, I've always been pretty cheap and low budget on the way I do things. And I've found that making my own tools is often a way to save thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, another reason I like this, as I mentioned before, is I'm a geek and I just enjoy these things. And I think you have to be a little bit geeky to really get into this stuff. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, another reason why I think it's a good to do this is there's opportunities. People want different things. People want to like, if you're competing as a designer or as an artist with a whole bunch of other designers, anything you can do to make yourself unique or to give yourself a, a skill or a set of tools that other people don't have, that is to your benefit. And I don't mean to sound all capitalistic dog eat dog, but that's the reality of it you can learn a skill and it can allow you to do things that other people can't do. And that is good. People want that. Not all the time, but sometimes, a lot of the times people want something unique. It also gives you your own voice, right? It gives you a lot of the technology that we engage with. We're forced to kind of engage with it in the way that it wants us to. You know, when you look at your cell phone, say you look at, you know, what if I, instead of like scrolling sideways to scroll through apps, like, I don't know, I want to push and I want to kind of zoom through them or something like, I can't do that. The only way I can navigate is by scrolling through these little squares. What if I wanted them to be triangles? Like, what if I wanted them to be circles or random, you know, each app on my screen is a different shape. Like, you can't do that, right? You have no control because you're forced to like follow this set of rules that Apple or Samsung or Android developers have created. And so it's not about you. It's about, you know, doing, following the path kind of. And I find that less interesting. I like to step outside the box. Um, I like to use this analogy that technology is kind of, if you think of it like our current technological landscape, it's kind of, if we use an analogy to furniture, it would be like, imagine that the only type of furniture that you know comes to you from a handful of companies, five companies, and there are, you know, a few models. Every, you know, you have this chair, you have this chair, and that's it. And if you want to buy a chair, you have to go to like Ikea, or you have to go to wherever, Walmart or something, and you have this handful of different chairs, and that's it. Uh, imagine like how great it would be if you, when you discovered like, you know what, I could actually build my own chair. Like I could just go buy some wood and you know, if I want to build a deck chair, like you can actually do that and it can be actually rewarding and it can be cheaper and it can be more practical. And like, I feel like that's kind of the area that we're swimming in right now with technology. We have all these tools and yet we're, we're not like really using them in a way that caters to our own needs. Anyways, that's my, we can, I, I have a lot to say about that, but I'll try not to talk about that too much more. 
Um, I'll just say there's some reasons why you shouldn't use custom tools. Um, if there is a cheaper, better option that already exists, don't go waste your time building your own thing. Don't reinvent the wheel. Like I said, it's not about making your own tool. It's about what's best for the need that you have. Um, if you hate computers and every time you turn a computer, it stresses you out and you, it, they, it frustrates you, you making custom tools, digital tools probably isn't for you. Uh, if you have a short temper and you get frustrated easily, <laughs> custom tools might not be for you because they take a lot of time and they take a lot of patience and, and like messing around. Um, also, yeah, if you're on a short timeline, if you have a project that's coming up and maybe, you know, deciding that you want to build a custom thing for the first time isn't the right idea when you have a deadline in a few weeks. I mean, it might miraculously pull through and that's happened to me before, but it also might fail horribly and you might just never want to do it again. So usually the best time to start doing this is when you're relaxed, you've got some time, you can like spend your evenings learning, watching YouTube and learning how to, you know, make something really simple happen so that you can make something more complex happen down the road. That's the best time. And then slowly find projects that you can apply your knowledge to. Um, I've done that every time. It's been a great way. Also, I mean, having some pressure of like, I got to make this thing work by next Friday, that does, I think is useful as well. Um, some challenges that you'll face when you're making custom software or hardware is there's a learning curve. It's like, it's really like learning a new language. And if you've had to learn a new language like French or English or Spanish or Japanese or whatever it is, you realize like you are, when you start off, you are reduced to these like, you know, toddler level vocabulary. And you kind of have to sit with that and like figure out what you can do with that. And slowly you develop more and more skills and slowly you develop more language and then you're able to do more things with it. But it's a challenge at the beginning. Um, and, but what I, I think it's really rewarding. You know, if, if anybody has learned a language, doesn't it feel great? It's like, wow, I stuck through it and now I can have a conversation in, with another person. It's kind of that same thing. Um, another thing that you'll face, and I mentioned this before, is that you might face like challenges from your coworkers or from other structures like performance venues or unions or those sorts of things. Um, we're talking here about like radical change sometimes and not every institute or organization is really able to facilitate that all the time. And so if you come in and you say, you know what, we don't need a lighting operator anymore because, or a sound operator or a video operator, because actually it's all just running off of one computer saying that, you know, even as I say it now, I'm sure there's lots of people that are like, but yes, we do. We need this, you know, it's radical and it's something we have to face, you know, uh, and I don't know how we can get past that. Um, those fears and those worries, especially when we're talking about people's jobs, but that's, it is kind of an obstacle, the old versus the new, uh, it's always there. So, uh, oh, I have a question coming in. What tools would you recommend for creators to have to be agile enough to play with custom solutions? Is there a specific coding language? He slash me would recommend learning. Um, well, we'll get into that. I mean, it really depends what you want to do. I think having, if you're, for example, a sound designer, having your workstation there with you and being able to quickly make changes to sound, quickly export those and quickly get them into QLab and know how to manipulate that, like that will give you a whole, that will make you a valuable asset compared to somebody that says, uh, you know, when the director asks them, hey, can you make those birds a little less annoying? And you have to go, okay, I'll take a note and I'll get back to you tomorrow. If you can do it on the spot as their people are rehearsing, like good on you, you should be able to do that. So that's like, that's one way just to respond as a designer. Another area 
that we're going to look at is this idea of real-time processes and real-time software. So that software that it is working and happening in real time, meaning that you're able to make changes on the fly, kind of like QLab. I mean, QLab's kind of real time. I'm thinking of like Touch Designer, Isadora, Max MSP. All of these softwares facilitate real time interaction. And that's a way to um, respond more quickly because you can say, you know, in Touch Designer, I can make I can bring in a live video camera. I can apply a series of filters onto that. So I can say, make my image black and white, and now apply a color filter to it that changes the image more red. And now apply a distortion effect, which makes the image look like a broken TV. And now crop the image so it looks like this. You can do that, and you can start to play with it. And then if it doesn't work, you don't have to re-render something. You don't have to go home and make a big change and export a thing. You walk over to your computer and you change. If I don't want my image to be red, if I want it to be blue, I click one button and instantly it's blue. And now we're working with blue. And hey, what if it like changes like a rainbow all the time? Like you can program that. And so that's the benefit of doing this. Is it? It just makes you very, very agile to use your word and like dexterous and and you're able to respond in real time. And I think that's what designing should be about. And that's the like paradigm shift that's happening is designing is moving, well, it can move from this process of like, tell me to do something, I go away, I do it, I bring you back this like object that I've created, I show it to you, you say it's good or not, or you just accept that that's what we have, that's all the time we have. You know, I think that was kind of the old way. Now it's like, Let's work together. Like I'm the designer, I'm in the room, I'm an active character and part of this production. And I'm able to respond as fast as an actor can respond when you tell them to speak louder. You know, I can make the image brighter, bang, the image is brighter. Like that's what that's why this is so exciting. Um, I like, I mean, if you want to learn a language, I I like touch designer. I like Python, but we can get into that. Um, for sound designers, are there any software you suggest learning for flexibility? I like Logic Pro. I was using a Mac. Logic Pro, I mean, there's, if we're talking about sound design, there's, you have your, your software that you use to create your sounds with. So that's your like digital audio workstation, DAW, Logic, Pro Tools, Ableton, right? Usually, I mean, Ableton has its own kind of thing, which I think is really promising. But usually you create your content you export it, and then you have a separate piece of software that you play things back in. And so I like to be able to do things in the room. So maybe that means just like having your logic session open, going through the speakers in the rehearsal hall, and being able to like play around with different sounds and manipulate them in real time. And then you, once you get it and it's like, yeah, that's great, then you export it and then you put it into QLab. Another method that I like to work with is to like, especially if I'm like layering sounds. So for example, a trick that I like to use in sound design is if I want to create like a, an ambience, like a forest ambience, for example, instead of just taking one audio effect file that's like the forest, what I'll do is I'll take five different files. I'll take a wind file. I'll take a grass blowing file. I'll take a wood creaking in the trees. I'll take leaves blowing, whatever it is, a bunch of sounds. And instead of compositing them all in, in a tool like Logic, I'll drag them into to QLab. And then I will, adjusting the levels of each and placing each one into a different speaker, I will create this immersive environment that I'm able to control the variables of in real time. So I'm able to sit in the room and hear, there's too much wind right now. Turn it down. I wish the bird was chirping from right there in that speaker. Put it into that speaker. That's one little trick that I like to do. So it's like balancing. If you can do a lot of stuff in QLab, I mean, this comes with like experience. It's hard. To, I can't give you a solid answer when to do what. But if you can do as much as you can in QLab, that gives you the most flexibility. And if you haven't figured it out already, like flexibility, like that's what I'm talking about here. That's like one of the main things in 
design, I think, that I like is like the ability to be flexible and to respond as if you were a person in the room because you are a person in the room. Um, I, I mean, just to talk about some software that I, I think I've already mentioned all of it. QLab is great. OBS, if you're doing video conferencing, by the way, and you haven't checked out OBS, you really should. If you're doing any sort of video things involving a live camera and bringing in your screen, use OBS. Max MSP, I like that software. I'll, we'll look at that. Isadora is great for video. Touch Designer is my favorite. It's like the maybe the big brother of Isadora. And then, I mean, there's other tools like the Stream Deck. Uh, like, do you know about this thing? Oh, I have it plugged in here. This is like a tool that you can get, and it just allows you to make these custom buttons, right? So, for example, I have this one here. This is like open up YouTube on my web browser. This shows me my like CPU power. This is like a little clock. Um, this is a timer here. I mean, these are silly, but this you can't see them. But these are for Zoom. So this is mute my mic. This is like exit the room. This is share my screen. So all I have to do is press these buttons. You can get this and you can use this in QLab. You can use this with OSC. So you can essentially control anything. And you can, this is just like one page. Like you can have multiple pages of these different customizable buttons. Um, and so this is a way to just give yourself custom control over the software that you're using. It's called Stream Deck by Elgato. Great. So I think we can jump into the case study here. Um, if there's no more questions, or if anybody has the last question, you'll have a chance at the end, but feel free to ask away. And if Emily, if you could get the Crowhurst video lined up with sound, we're going to play that next. An ocean is not an ocean. It is not a location. It is a blue, swooning universe. The siren, the kraken, the white whale. These are not the perils of the slow, open ocean. No. The true danger is imagination. For on the ocean a man is not a man, he is a small god in his own small universe, an infinite, unchartable cosmos. So that was a trailer for The Last Voyage of Donald Crowhurst which was a show that I worked on. That was written by Eric Rose and David Van Bell. We started working on that, I think, in, in 2011 with um, Ghost River Theater. And it, it premiered in 2014 at Alberta Theater Projects here in Calgary. Um, that show, as you can see, involved a lot of video. And it, um, it was pretty complex. Uh, and I was brought on to kind of, as a video designer, to solve a problem that that the creative team had. Uh, the first problem was, how do we get a live camera on stage that will allow us to record someone's face, an actor on stage, as they're talking, and have that image projected behind them without so much delay that it takes away from the performance. I'm sure you've all experienced this if you've worked with live cameras, 
that delay, um, especially if you're doing things that require kind of an audio, like a live audio to video sync, um, that delay can be disastrous for video design because if I if you're watching me talk, and even if I were if this were happening right now, if you were watching me talk and or you heard my voice and then a second later you saw my lips moving, it would just like you would be really distracted and you would want to like punch this computer, I'm sure. So that was something we were facing. Um, we started working this in 2011, as I mentioned, maybe even before. It was when the Green Fools still had a space in the church. Uh, by the stampede, anyone knows that. Um, we we started rehearsing this and we started with really kind of basic things. We had this analog mixer and we had two cameras going into it and that was plugged into a capture card that we had plugged into the computer to get a video signal from a, two cameras that we could mix and then get into the, the computer and we were using QLab. Um, we found quickly though that that solution in terms of delay was not good. It was like there was like a second of delay. It also meant that we could only have two video cameras. And we had an ambitious idea here where we wanted to maybe have like four video cameras or maybe even five. Um, and so uh, we quickly realized that QLab and the analog cameras were not going to work. So um, we also had the challenge of we need multiple projection screens. We want to have a very large backdrop. We want to have individually mapped sails because Don Crowhurst was a sailor, a wannabe sailor. We need to have individually mapped sails that would come down and that we could projection map on each one. We wanted to have a TV on screen that you could send content to. Um, we wanted to have, oh, the ability for the screen to become a half screen so it can go up and it becomes a half screen. We wanted to have four or five live cameras um, we wanted to have green screen technology so that we could do kind of like a broadcast thing, like a weather cast moment. We wanted to be able to do live effects onto video, um, more than what QLab was able to offer. QLab can offer kind of one effect. We wanted to be able to do what I described before, make it monochrome, distort it, make it change its crop size. We had all these needs. And at the time, um, there was not really, oh, and another thing, we also had a pretty small budget. We didn't have 50,000 bucks to buy like a D3 or like a hippo system or anything like that. Um, and it also had to run consistently and be easy enough that an operator who wasn't familiar with the system could use it. So these were all the needs that we had. And I started searching, what can, how can we do this? It must be possible. And I discovered um, through a workshop that I attended in Montreal, uh, this software called Touch Designer. And, oh, sorry, before I want to say that, I also have to say, before we did this, we tried Watch Out, and Watch Out failed so miserably. I don't like that software. I'm sorry. It is like so, at least it was so popular. Don't use it. It sucks. It kind of sucks for this stuff. Um, and it's really expensive, super expensive. Um, but I discovered this other software called Touch Designer. And this was in 2011. Uh, it had just, it's been around for a while, but not too many people were using it. But I saw a few projects that had been made with it. And I went, wow, that's what we want. I saw live camera feeds coming in with zero latency or very low latency. And I thought, yes, that's what we need. I saw crazy effects and real-time graphics. Um, and I got, wow, like, yes, this is the thing we want. And I think this is just on a sidebar. This is how you should learn what software you want to use. Find a project that inspires you and figure out how they did it. That's how I've, that's how I've done it. Every single thing that I've done is just, I, I see something cool and I look to their, its creator. Or maybe I contact them. Maybe I look on YouTube or Facebook or posts or whatever. And I, I figure out what tools they're using. And then I try to do that. Um, so with touch designer, um, I was able to, on a relatively small budget, build this show. Um, and what we ended up having was seven outputs, uh, four projectors, you know, five projectors, a like analog television, and then like another, maybe two analog televisions. There were seven unique outputs 
there were um, four real-time camera feeds, HD signals coming in uh, from the stage. Um, we were doing edge blending and warping on the images. So we, if you saw there, we had like this really large um, screen uh, that was actually made up of four projectors that we edge blend together to create this like 40 foot size screen and this massive image that was super high resolution. We had effects, we had green screen. Um, we had a, we had 0% 0 0 failure, although maybe like one or 2% failure, but like really it ran flawlessly and it ran off one single computer. Um, and I could tell you the cost of it was to do all this, and this is including the cost of four video cameras and building a brand new computer, it was under $10,000. So, you know, wow, that was crazy. Um, the computer, I guess I could talk about that a little bit. Um, I really believe in, in making your own computer. Uh, why not, right? Like, since you're making your own things, why not make your own computer? I'm a fan of PCs only for the price point. Well, not only, and for the like flexibility and the customization. If you want to build a video or media computer, make it yourself. Or if you want to do this stuff with your computer, I'm sorry, but your Mac to do what you need, it might be really expensive. And for the same price that you would pay for a Mac computer, you can build your own Windows computer and it can be way, way, way faster and you'll have the satisfaction of making your own computer. Or you know what, if you don't wanna make it, you can like pay someone a hundred bucks and they can make it for you. Um, video card technology has developed so much in the last few years. Um, you can now run like incredible graphics off of a single video card, you know, that's about this big that you plug into your computer. Um, I should also mention that using a laptop has its limitations and you might find that it's not it might be powerful enough but it might not have the sort of in out capacity that a desktop computer would have um, usually you want to have multiple outputs out of your computer so that you can have multiple projectors connected to your computer and there's ways to do that with a laptop but you have to buy this separate device and it can be kind of sketchy or it can be like 2000 bucks, like a data path. Um, and so probably a better thing to do, although it's not a laptop, is to build a small desktop computer. You can get cases that are like this big and that you can have uh, like kick-ass powerful computer inside of it that has five outputs uh, that you can get a, a, a card that you insert into it that you can plug in multiple video camera feeds that is you know just super powerful tons of memory i i highly recommend doing that and if you don't know how to start there's resources online if you go on youtube and you type in how to build a custom gaming computer you will find literally a thousand videos in every language of every type of person telling you how to do that and walking you through that process in a very like friendly way. And that's how I've built all the computers that we have. Um, uh, so yeah, I don't know if there's any questions about this so far. I can show you the like the system that I built. I mean, another part of this was that I actually had to program this all in touch designer and I had to make it so that it could be controlled over the network using QLab. So this wasn't easy. Um, I should give a shout out to my partners on this project, uh, Vlad and Laura. I uh, hope you're watching Vlad. Vlad's teaching one of the, giving a talk as part of this, this conference, the symposium. I should also give a shout out to Matthew Reagan, who's also giving a, a talk at the symposium. He is like the touch designer master teacher, and he's been so generous over the last 10 years, like I have called him. I don't, this was 10 years ago. I called him and he helped me up. Uh, I don't know if you can just call him up anymore. Can we call you Matt? Um, and he's just been so useful. He has so many tutorials online. If you want to get into this stuff, like, thank you so much, Matthew Reagan. Um, 
So the, the tools are available, the information is available to you. It's just like the time and your patience. That's all it is. Um, I'm going to show you my touch designer screen here. Oops, not that one. Uh, here we go. So this is touch designer. I'm not going to go hardcore into this because it's, it's complicated or it's a little complicated to explain in five minutes, but I'm just going to show you what this patch looks like here. Um, so this is, these are all the cues in the show. There's a lot of cues. Touch Designer is a piece of software that is a graphic programming language. So what it allows you to do is to connect these boxes together to create a, um, to create things. For example, here I'm going to show you like, here's a little video playing. I think Andrew's giving a workshop in Touch Designer too. You should take it. Um, say I want to do something like blur this video. I'm not sure if you can see all my pop-ups here, but this is now a blur procedure. And I have parameters over here. So when I turn up these parameters, notice that now it's more blurred. Or say I want to flip this thing upside down before I blur it. I can add a I can add something called the transform onto here. And now I'm able to rotate my image, say, or I'm able to just kind of move it over here or do whatever I want to it. Or I'm able to say, scale it down on the X and Y axis to make it smaller. Um, you can do a whole bunch of stuff. This is just very simple, but using these building blocks, you can create complex networks that allow you to modify video, generate real-time graphics, um, run a speeder show, do live green screening. So, I mean, this patch is like, I haven't opened it in 10 years, so it's kind of broken and there's all the videos aren't there, but you know, you can see I built this area for cameras. So I have four cameras coming in and on each camera, I was able to kind of, I made this uh, text object here so that when I was, troubleshooting the cameras, I could quickly kind of switch back and forth between the live camera feed and this, this box that said cam one. Um, here's my like surface mapping. Each one of these is a different surface. So here's the half screen, here's the front projector, here's the TV, here's the sail. Um, so you can do this in any, in inf an infinite amount of ways. Uh, it's customizable. So you can arrange this and solve your problem in any way that you want. These are the resolutions of each surface. Um, and then it was all kind of combined together and sent out as one massive 7,168 pixels wide by 768 pixels high image. So this tool is really powerful. I don't have time to get into all this, but if you're interested in learning this in more depth, um, we are, well, you should check out Andrew's, um, workshop and we're also, uh, going to be showing, uh, I'm also offering a class in touch designer, um, in, later on in the year. So stay in touch. Um, oh, it looks like my captions have stopped as well. Sorry. I'll just see if my captions will come back here. There we go. Um, uh, so yeah, that was, oh, I'm curious about the pros and cons of Ableton Live for theater. Ableton Live is really great in that it is a digital audio workstation that allows you to compose, playback, and manipulate sounds and DJ and quantize, quantize in real time. It's what's used by every DJ on earth almost. That's not totally true, but it's a very useful tool for creating sound. Um, if you can find a way, the whole thing about using 
those softwares or logic is finding the tool that you is compatible with you, right? Like I never, I always found when I was trying to arrange audio clips in Ableton Live that it was kind of annoying. And it was like, it wasn't able, my, the mixing and the kind of track layout I find wasn't as friendly as Logic. Logic also had built-in surround sound tools that I like to use that Ableton didn't have. For example, Logic has the ability to add a surround sound plugin that will put your sound into like multi-channel reverb so that you can like have the gunshot fire from your speaker over there, but then you hear it kind of reverberate from all around you, which is a really good audio effect. Um, oh. How's my audio? Is it still kind of scratchy? Um, I wonder if there's anything I can do about that. It looks the same on my end. Maybe I'm talking too loud. <laughs> I'm getting all excited here. Sorry, folks. Preserving audio quality. Um, OK. What alternatives to QLab do you recommend? Oh, on Windows? I don't know. I don't think there are. That's the problem. If what I've been talking about is like making a custom computer for um, for video, um, and I, uh, I for it, for playback and for sequencing, QLab is still the best. But unfortunately, it's only for Wind or for Mac. And uh, I've actually spoken. They they came to the. BAM Center a few years ago and I went and I spoke with some of the creators and the programmers of QLab. They're all awesome and super nice. And I asked them, like, can you please make this for Windows? And they said, we want to make software that works really well. And we have a small team and branching into another platform is not feasible for us right now. And so I keep a computer around that I've had for 10 years and that's my QLab computer and all I use it for, it's a Mac laptop and all I use it for is QLab. Um, so yeah, sorry about that. I wish there was an alternative and like I would totally buy into it. Why Touch Designer over Isadora? Touch Designer is just more flexible. Isadora is great and I highly recommend it as your first tool if this is like the first um, time that you're entering into, into uh, node-based programming languages. That's what I mean by, you know, the little boxes that you connect together. Um, Isidore is great and it has a built-in sequencing system, but I found the touch designer is just more powerful. And I, coming from Max MSP, which is more challenging than both of those softwares, uh, unfortunately, I found touch designer, like I didn't have a problem with the learning curve. Um, and you'll just find that professionals that are working in video and are taking that path of custom software are probably using something like Touch Designer. Um, I think Andrew wants to come in and ask a question. Hello. Hello. I'm back. That's great, Matt. It's really good to hear you talk about all these things. And uh, I'm, I'm very curious about your broken network, and I would love to uh, get on into it. At some point, um, but yeah, I know. I just I quickly wanted to uh, uh, ask you about uh, Deep Website, and uh, maybe you could speak a little bit on that. Yes, I was just about to go into that. Sorry, I'm like my That's time awesome. management is. <laughs> Let's move on. Okay. That's what I'm here for. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I have a video prepared. I should warn you before you play the video. We intentionally made this video sound like obnoxiously in your face. So I just recommend you turn down your volume a tiny bit because it's kind of loud. Uh, but you can play that now.
There you go. How's that for obnoxious? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I can talk about Deep website. Did you want to ask any questions or anything, Andrew? Or do you have any thoughts? Uh, not specifically. No, I just I just wanted to make sure you you mentioned it at least because you mentioned it earlier on and wanted to hear right. it. Great. So, Deep website is a project that I developed with my partner uh, Craig Fawner, who's out in Toronto now. Hello, Craig, if you're watching. I um, we developed this for uh, well, for it's had a number of iterations. We performed it at Sled Island Festival here in Calgary. We presented it at uh, as an installation at the um, uh, Eastern Block in Montreal for anybody out there. And it recently was shown at the Alberta Gallery of Art um, as an installation. And the reason I want to talk about this piece is. Uh, this is for the, this is for the more get even deeper into programming and and to kind of talk about how far you can go with this stuff. Um, uh, deep website is a piece that talks about online privacy and uh, as a it exists as a performance, which is the clip that you saw there, and it also exists as an installation. And so the performance. Um, the kind of what was going on there, it, was, it wasn't actually too complicated. We just made a bunch of videos using 3D software, using screen captures. Um, it's about a person that wants to get really jacked at like big muscles and decides to go onto the dark web, the deep web, to buy some like illicit substances to help them get ripped really fast. And um, and it's kind of this like descent into the like depths of the deep web, and they end up like buying this thing and kind of transforming into this monster. Um, uh, so that was the performance. Um, the installation, which I'm going to show you some pictures of here, um, this took place at Rex City, which was a uh, an event that happened here in Calgary, where we transformed an old office space into a art installation. Uh, we did the performance there again. Um, but for this, we wanted to be able to take uh, people, allow people to come in and voluntarily submit their Facebook information. So Facebook allows you to download the information that it has on you, including your likes that it uh, and your kind of advertising information that it uses to sell things to you, as well as a whole bunch of things like uh, if you use it on your cell phone, um, the GPS coordinates of where every time you logged into it, um, I hope everybody has that turned off by now, by the way. Um, uh, but Facebook has a lot of information and that was the kind of the basis for our project. So what we did is we allowed people, you can go and you can download this on Facebook, download my data. It arrives as this zipped JSON file. JSON is like a text format. And what we did is we created custom software that allowed us to upload this to a computer and that computer would automatically take these people's data and generate a customized virtual reality experience from that where they, when they put on the headset, they were transported to the, their most frequently accessed location where they used Facebook. So using uh, Google street maps, we were able to, um, take the information that we got from people's Facebook accounts and uh, automatically download Google Street Maps in like a 3D perspective. So when people were in the VR, the first thing they saw was often standing outside of their house or their like place of work or somewhere where they used Facebook a lot. Um, and we also took their AdWords and we started like advertising to them with like their favorite band. Um, and then I don't want to, well, I'll give away the secret because it's awesome. We took them on this like dive, deep dive into the deep web, where at one point they were confronted by these like grotesque monsters with, they were actually the names of the people that they had defriended. So the first five people that they had defriended on Facebook kind of came back to haunt them. We're kind of lurking in this um, digital, digital um, hell, we called it. 
Um, so in order to do that, we had to create custom software that allowed us, that would automatically take people's Facebook data, parse it, so separate the data into what we wanted, um, and then go online and download all these things. So it would um, download uh, the, um, for example, the, uh, sorry, the door's open here. Um, it would download people's uh, advertisement words. It would download pictures of them from Google search. So we'd like, you know, get a picture of Nickelback or whatever it is and like download that. It would go to Google and it would automatically download their mat, their, their uh, GPS coordinates and bring that into Unity. Uh, we were all running this in Unity. Uh, and we also used Touch Designer to kind of like create these graphic overlays. So this was like quite technological challenging. Um, the next iteration, when we did it at the Eastern Block, we wanted people, or no, when we did it at the AGA, we wanted people to be able to um, submit their information to a secure server online and then come to the gallery and have this experience. Um, because the first iteration, we actually kind of had to, it was still kind of manual. We had to like move some files around and stuff. We wanted to completely automate it. And so this previous pictures that you saw here, uh, there's a picture that shows this keypad. And what that was, was a keypad that allowed people to, this is us meeting and like consulting with some of the people at the uh, Rec City. Uh, so this keypad here, you could come and you could enter this four digit code that was emailed to you after you uploaded your Facebook information to our like secure website. And we actually had a computer that was running in the cloud. It was like a Linux computer um, and it was, it was like receiving your data. It was downloading all these images off of Google and like collecting pictures of your bands and your Google and your uh, street maps coordinates and um, building these kind of monsters. And then it was syncing this to the computer that was running Unity in the gallery. Um, and so when people came, they entered into this custom code that they received in their email and they were given this customized experience of their based on their Facebook data. And so in order to do that, we obviously had to do a lot of programming. And, you know, I don't know, this doesn't necessarily relate to live performance because it's probably a little like beyond a live performance environment. But I think what I can encourage you to kind of take from this is that, um, you know, you could, I mean, now we're thinking about Zoom performances, we're thinking about online performances. I think the nature of performance is changing and we're in a situation where we're able to kind of incorporate these more high tech things into our performances. I mean, you know, you could do that same sort of idea that we did with Deep Website. Um, we actually, the, the second version was actually called Deep Solutions, by the way. Um, but you can take this idea of like maybe taking people's video or like some of their information and processing it in some way and then feeding it back to them in real time. Um, and, uh, you know, you can do that. You can do that on a computer that you have in the space with you, or you can do it in what's called a virtual machine that's like running on a server in the cloud. And so using a, like, um, a, a service like DigitalOcean, uh, it allows you to essentially have a computer that you can log into. It's as if you're using your computer right now. It exists online and you can log into it and you can program it and you can tell it to do things. Um, and so we, we uh, made a program using uh, Python and PHP where it took this list of people's, you know, friends, removed friends, and it extracted the first five based on the date. Because we figured, just as a side note, we'd figured the, the first five people that you defriended were probably like real doozies. You know, you had to like go through the process of realizing, uh, oh, I, I don't like this person. I need to get rid of them. So we figured the first five people were probably like real poignant and, and like good, real disturbing ones. So that's why we chose that. But, um, you know, this software, it took those five names, it sent it to the computer. The computer then like added a text box that was floating around this animated monster. Um, and, you know, that was the live experience for people. Um, yeah, that's like a brief overview. <laughs> I could go into the details, but 
it's probably a little more than we have time for in the next 10 minutes. It would be great to take some questions or to chat I, with I, I actually am very kind of curious because I think as a, a starting point, that's a really complex, very interesting project. It's got a lot of layers to it and a lot of pieces. And so I'm very curious how you would have started the process. Like what would have been the planning stages? Uh, what would you have had to get in like in first before you could actually start building the tools that you needed in order to put the project together? I always start with like a need and outlining your needs very clearly and making sure that aligning those needs with the solution that best suits them, either financially, time-wise, stability, ease of use, whatever it is. So we approached it with, we have the need of wanting to take this file that Facebook gives us that, and you know, it, it arrives as a zipped file with three folders in it. One of the folder contains a text file that has your ex friends. One of the folder contains another text file that has GPS coordinates in it. One of the folder contains another text file that has a list of 2000 ad words that, that Facebook has like extracted from you. So our objective there is to take these three pieces of information and apply different processes onto them. So the first process is take this list of ex communicated friends. There's a long list of them and they have dates next to them. Arrange them by date and take the first five and then create a new text file that just has five names in it and is called remove friends. The second task, take the GPS coordinates and sort them by frequency. So we figured out if somebody had logged into the same, you know, coordinate multiple times, sort that and that will give you probably a place that's significant to them because if they're logging in from the same place it's probably a place that people will recognize so sort it by the most accessed gps coordinates take the top five of those and you know there's a bunch of duplicates so just remove all of the duplicates that you just have and create a new text file that has five lines of it that are five lines of gps code and those gps coordinates are the most accessed gps coordinates for this person then upload this file to a server that translates the, the GPS coordinates into a physical address, then use like a Google interface that allows you to put in an address and download five images, north, south, east, west, down and up, or I guess that's six. Then take those images and put them into another file structure, then tell Unity to reference that file structure when it's building this world that is a box that has five images on it that somebody is sitting in the middle of. And when they look around, they see. So it's really breaking it down into steps. And that's what programming and custom tool creation is about. It's breaking your complex process into simple steps. That's what QLab is really. You have this thing that says, I want, my goal is to like fade in a sound and then pause it and then fade in another sound. Like, okay, first step, fade in this sound second step, do this, right? So it's really like taking a complex thing and breaking it down. Okay. And how would you have uh, some kind of a document that lines this out? Like what, before you actually go into the digital realm, do you build out some kind of analog uh, mind map or some kind of creative concept that you know, like this step and then this step and then this step? Uh, yeah. I mean, kind of, it's, it's, it's pretty like, it's just a text document, get ex, you know, <laughs> parse images or like parse GPS locations, remove duplicates, create a new text document with those ones. Like it's, it's pretty much that. Sweet. And I kind of just have it in my head of like how to do that. And then before I go and like automate everything, I usually do it manually and like, you know, how hard is it for me to manually go and download these images? How hard is it for me to like manually put them in a folder in, in Unity and like set it up so that Unity references these images? And then once you've like made that part work, then you can start to automate it so you don't have to do all those manual things. Right. That's a really, really useful piece of information. Um, I wanted to ask quickly, um, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to ask them. Uh, just a quick thing I wanted to know, have you ever, how much experience do you have using Touch Designer with audio? Because I know that you build your own. You I don't use stuff. it for audio. No, not at all. I okay. you can, but it's yeah. I've used it to like 
bring in mics. And in these programming languages, share a code. you know, effects rack that is like your audio effects unit that apply, you know, that you can plug a mic into and play reverb for it. Um, that rack might have a MIDI in that allows you to change the parameters to like select the big reverb or the small reverb. And so that rack speaks MIDI. Um, your QLab also speaks MIDI. So you can program these things in QLab that allow QLab and your physical hardware to talk to each other. Um, and that's also true in the like software realm. So Touch Designer can talk to QLab via the OSC, you know, network interface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've uh, I've personally taken to using Touch Designer and routing it through Resolume using NDI and using OSC to fire queues back and forth between different software. So yeah, yeah. there you go. Like it it's. Using something like Resolume, I didn't mention that, but that's a great tool to like quickly build things and like use Touch Designer as your main kind of thing that like gets your video or does something, and then use Resolume as a way to add effects. Like that's excellent. Yeah, the the layering is important. I find with the the custom tools that you build, using totally. more than one software and not being um, shoehorned into one particular creation style. I find once you learn one thing. Everything kind of like it's easy to learn another tool. Once you have this basic set of understandings and you know that software developers are trying to make their tools easy for you to use and you trust that, you can see that there's sides, they share a lot of things in common, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, that's, uh, this is great. This has been a wonderful presentation. So um, if you have any last okay. things you want to say to people before we sign off, I want to like add my just give a plug out to our studio here, Asva Digital Access Ed Media Arts. This is our Instagram handle. We need some Instagram love here, folks. Um, so feel free to add us. And also, mm -hmm. I mentioned that um, we're going to start a series of an educational series in the next coming months. Um, it'll be online, and we're going to talk about. I mean, maybe a lot of similar things that you're doing here at Level Up, but it'll be over a period of, you know, multiple weekly gatherings where we get into the like deeper nuts and bolts of using these softwares and kind of actually creating your own tools uh, for live performance. So I hope this has been like a good intro and it satisfied enough folks for concept and a bit of like technical detail. But if you want some more, like, Follow us on Instagram, and we're actually gonna keep the education rolling. Yeah, I'm really that's exciting. I'm I didn't know about that. I'm looking forward to that now too. Yeah, more, more information, more ways to learn, and uh, just keep the conversation going. So, and uh, check out Andrew's check out Andrew's workshop. You're talking about touch designer, right? Like you're doing a thing. Yep, yep. sure I am. It's an introduction, and uh, the actual workshop itself, unfortunately, we've reached our cap as far as the people, because oh. it'd be hard to be teaching too many people, but the video will be available edited after the fact, so the uh, just a certain tutorial is to get through it, and I'll be happy to attach my email to it, so anybody has any questions at any point, you can always ask. I'm always happy to uh, delve into that more uh, in creating my own custom tools, so. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, so, Matt, thank you so much for this. This has been absolutely lovely. Really happy that you uh, kicked off the symposium with our first oh, presentation. Thanks so, so much.